There are things we all struggle with in life. We may battle emotions of all kinds. We take on the criticism of others, or even from ourselves. In unexpected ways, moments in life often bring grief to the surface, and never at the best time. And many of us sit in loneliness, thinking we are left to battle all of this alone. Our feelings in all of these battles might not be right, but they are real. How do we keep on the path God wants for us when some of these things come at us? The struggle is real. When I was nine years old, I was ready to go play ball with my friends. I gathered up all the equipment. My dad from his softball days had some bases. I got a couple bats, a couple of hard balls, a catcher's mitt and a catcher's mask. And then I had my first baseman's mitt. I took them all up to the field where I was gonna play with my friends about a half a mile from where I lived. Put the bases out, we were playing our game and somehow, some way, Eddie and I got into it. He wasn't happy with me and I'm not really sure what happened, but he decided he wanted to fight. Eddie was bigger and taller, weighed more than I did. And I thought, this isn't a good situation. My dad had been a boxing coach, but he never really taught me how to box. And so I'm up there and I'm trying not to get hit and trying to go back and forth. And, and I thought, well, my brother Arthur taught me how to wrestle. And so I thought, I'm gonna get up close to him and I'm gonna tie him up and then I'm gonna take him down and get on top of him so he can't hit me. Well, it worked. I was able to get him down. I had him in a hold and he couldn't move at all. But while this is going on, all the other people, all the other guys that were there playing with us are yelling and they're screaming. And every one of them were cheering on Eddie and they were saying, quit holding him down, you sissy, fight him like a man. And I'm thinking, I don't know that I want to do that, but I was gotten afraid because all these people were yelling at me. Well, Eddie said, well, you let me up. I said, sure. So I let him up, fully expecting that there was gonna be fisticuffs, but he didn't fight me. He let it go, but they kept yelling. I gathered up all my equipment, started taking the shortcut home, but they kept coming after me, yelling and screaming on their bikes. After a while, it was only two or three that were left as I kept walking, but they kept cheering and jeering me the whole time. And then I thought, I've, I've, I've gotta get home, and what am I gonna do? I can't carry all this. So I threw it all over a fence. There was a golf course nearby there. I just threw it over in the fence and I ran home for the safety of my dad. My dad brought me back and thankfully, nobody stole any of the things that I'd thrown over the fence. But that was a time when I felt lonely. I was all alone, everybody was against me. And it was a long time before I was felt free to go back to that park to play. When I finally did, no one said a word. They didn't apologize, they didn't jeer me, they didn't make fun of me. We just went on and played ball and played in the playground just like we always had. About 10 years later, in the summer that I was gonna get married, I was living with my roommate in Southern Illinois. During the week, he was working at a farm and on weekends, he drove to a youth ministry. I was working construction, putting in gas pipelines. And then in the evening and on weekends, I was doing my youth ministry. And one weekend when he had gone, he didn't return. And I got nervous and scared about that. And I fell asleep and about two o'clock in the morning, I, I woke up again and I started making phone calls to find out as I talked to his pastor of his church that he'd been killed in a car accident that night. He had picked up a, a soldier and given him a ride and as they were going down the hill, there was raining, they hit a puddle of water, he lost control of the car, went into the other lane, hit another car head on. Both people in that car were killed, he was killed, and the soldier was mangled, but he survived. And at that time, at two o'clock in the morning, when my best friend was taken from me, I felt totally alone. I was scared, I was depressed, I was confused. Lonely events can cause loneliness. And during those times, I felt very alone and lonely. In 2018, there was a study by Cigna written by a woman by the name of Erin Carson. 
talking about loneliness at that time. And she writes and says from the study that 54% of people experience loneliness. The most lonely generation is the Generation Z. At that time, between 18 and 22, now it would be 20 to 24. And without the, the study also said that if you are lonely over an extended period of time, you have a 26% chance of risk of premature mortality. Mayo Clinic has done a study of loneliness and said it causes weight gain, it causes anxiety, and it causes uh, sleeplessness. Loneliness is real. The struggle is real. And in the light of the culture and the times in which we live in, it seems like it's probably higher than 54% because of what you and I are experiencing. I want to look at a text today that talks about this from a, a macro and a micro level. It's from the book of Lamentations. The word lamentation comes from the Hebrew word eka, which means how. How, God, could you allow this happen? How, God, am I going to get through it? We're not sure who wrote Lamentations, but generally it's been attributed to Jeremiah, who is known as the weeping prophet. And so there's a great reason for him to weep, as we'll see in this text. It is an interesting book in the sense that it's put together as a poem. There are five different poems, and each is constructed by an acrostic. They took the Hebrew alphabet, which has 22 letters in it, and started each line with a different letter of the alphabet. So four of the five chapters have 22 verses, and the chapter three that we'll be looking at, only part of it, has 66 verses, all based upon the Hebrew alphabet. Because it's poetry, it was sung. It was played with music. In fact, our text today, or part of our text, will be played during our communion time a little bit later in the service. So let's see what the writer of Lamentation says in the third chapter and verses 1 through 24. I am the man who has seen affliction by the rod of his wrath. He has driven me away and made me walk in darkness rather than light. Indeed, he has turned his hand against me again and again all day long. He has made my skin and my flesh grow old and has broken my bones. He has besieged me and surrounded me with bitterness and hardship. He has made me dwell in darkness like those long dead. He has walled me in so I cannot escape. He has weighed me down with chains. Even when I call out or cry for help, he shuts out my prayer. He has barred my way with blocks of stone. He has made my paths crooked, like a bear lying in wait, like a lion in hiding. He dragged me from the path and mangled me and left me without help. He drew his bow and made me the target for his arrows. He pierced my heart with arrows from his quiver. I became the laughingstock of all my people. They mocked me in song all day long. He has filled me with bitter herbs and sated me with gall. He has broken my teeth with gravel. He has trampled me down in the dust. I have been deprived of peace. I have forgotten what prosperity is. So I say, my spirit is gone and all that I had hoped from the Lord. I remember my affliction and my wandering, the bitterness and the gall. I well remember them and my soul is downcast within me. Yet this I will call to mind. And therefore I have hope because of the Lord's great love we are not consumed, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. I say to myself, the Lord is my portion, therefore I will wait for him. The writer here of Lamentations talks about loneliness and depression based at two levels. The national catastrophe and personal loss. What is going on in the writing here? is that Jerusalem has been destroyed by the Babylonians. It has been devastated. The temple has been burned down. And so their country is not like it was before. And the place where they would gather from worship was no longer in existence. Seems to me that there's some possible parallels in the light of what we experience 
but we've had an enemy from the outside, one that we cannot see, a virus which has changed life so that our country, our world, is not like it was before. We have racial upheaval and political divisiveness. We have economic issues that many of us are facing. And so at the macro level, because of what's happening nationally, there's time of loneliness, a time of depression. But it is also personal. For the writer, not only have these happened to other people, they've happened to him. He says, I am the man. I am the one that I've gone to God and he hasn't been there. He's been, been rogue. He has caused me all kinds of problems in my life. He has deserted and he has devastated me. And so many of us have also experienced personal issues that cause us to be lonely and to be depressed. There are many reasons for it on a personal level, loss of family, loss of friends, social ostracization, disease, sickness, dying, old age, economic collapse. All these things are reasons that cause us to feel lonely and detached. And so the, the struggle is real. It is not something you're making up. It's not even something that's unusual because I think that 54% is probably much higher in our particular time and age. And so if you're experiencing these kinds of feelings, this kind of isolation, you're experiencing with other people. But the question becomes, what's the answer? <laughs> How do I deal with this? How do I get out of this funk? How do I get out of withdrawal within myself? Well, I would call our attention back to the text again in verses 22 through 24. He says, because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed. His compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. There's a old great hymn. Great is your faithfulness, O God, my Father. I say to myself, the Lord is my portion, therefore I will wait for him. My encouragement to you is that in the midst of loneliness, in the midst of time of depression, is that you take the attention off of yourself and place it upon God. That you look to see that God is there with you and for you. Jesus said, I will not abandon you. I will not allow you to be orphans. Lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the age. Jesus experienced aloneness. Jesus experienced difficulties in his life. And therefore, he can relate to us. And he can be there to help us through these times of trial. And so I encourage you to count your blessings. Think upon these things, Paul says in, Roman, in Philippians 4.8. Think upon what is good and just and right and of good report. We need to have a change of thinking, a renewal of our mind, a different focus. That when we focus upon that which we've lost or that we just feel, that we can dig ourselves deeper down. That if we can pull ourselves up enough just to look up, if we're laying down on our back, just to look up to be able to see that our, where does our help come from? Our help comes from the Lord. Let's look to him. God is with you and he is for you. But the little boy was once said, when he said, you're not alone, son. God is always with you. And he said, yeah, I know that, dad. But sometimes it helps to have flesh and blood. <laughs> sometimes we need somebody with some skin on, somebody who is there. And so I would encourage you to find a, a community of faith. In fact, you found one here at Refinery Christian Church. For those of you that are a part of this congregation, you have a community of faith so that you will not be alone. Those of you who may be watching that are not a part of Refinery or not a part of any church, one of the purposes of the church is to find a community to help build you up, to strengthen you, to share values with, and encourage you to be able to go on. You are not alone. There are other people who care about God, who care about people, who care about you, that are willing to stand by your side. But of course, it's difficult in these days. We had a few weeks that we could worship together, and now we can't do that anymore, at least for the present time. And so that larger community is not accessible to all of us. But we also have a smaller group that's available in our church that's still accessible, and that's our life groups. 
There are some 38 groups that we have within the church. Some of them are not meeting this summer, but many of them are. And they're meeting remotely. They're meeting through Zoom or some other format like that. But it's a place where you can talk and you can share and you can be yourself. It can be a place where you can find some people who have common values, who have a faith in the God and in the, and going through some similar struggles that you can be able to do life with. And so I encourage you to find a community, a community large, a community small as well. But I would even take it another step further, and that is to find an individual. Now, it's hard when you're withdrawing. It's hard when you feel lonely. It's hard when you're depressed. But I would encourage you to take a step to be able to find someone that you can share your struggles, your joys, your hopes, and your fears with, and that you can have them share them as well. And when you do so, it's going to help you deal with that loneliness. It's going to help you come out of that. But one final step that I would encourage, and that is to do something for someone else. I've found in my life at times when I'm alone or particularly when I'm depressed, if I can take the step to, to look outside of myself and look to somebody else and do something for them, it helps me as well. And not only helps them and helps me, but it creates a bond as well is that there is an appreciation for what is done. And so I hope that you'll take that step. I read this last week in Time Magazine that uh, Jean Kennedy Smith just recently passed away at the age of 92. She's a younger sister of President John Kennedy. And the article begins by talking about an incident in her life that took place back in, during World War II in 1944. Two priests came to her family home to see her father and mother, Joseph and Rose Kennedy. And they came to inform them that their son, Joe, Joseph, had been killed at the war. Jean remembers being very disturbed by that. Her older brother has been killed. She felt lonely, she felt depressed, she felt great grief. And this is what she did instinctively. She got on her bike, she rode to the church, and went in the church and prayed. She went to look for God's help. But when she was done praying in the church, she got back on her bike and she rode to the hospital and volunteered in the hospital. Later, reflecting upon that, she thought, what else could I have done? What else could I do? She realized that one of the best things that she could do in her extreme loss is to bring encouragement and hope to someone else. And in that process, it not only helped that person, it helped herself. So my friends, you are not alone. God is with you. There's a community of faith. There's a small group. There are individuals who care about you and be willing to share your life with you. But you can also help others in that process as well. Jesus put it this way. He said this in John 16, 32 and 33. But a time is coming and has come when you will be scattered each to his own home. You will leave me all alone. Yet I am not alone, for my Father is with me. I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble. But take heart. I have overcome the world. Let us pray. Jesus, we're grateful to know that in the midst of the difficulties, the loneliness, the depressions that we might face, that we are not alone. You are with us. You're beside us. You're in front of us. You're behind us. You're within us. And I would pray for anyone today that might be struggling, that they might realize that you are there. May they be renewed day by day to see what the blessings are, to count the blessings that you've given, and to be able to know that your, your compassion, your mercies endure forever. Help us, Father, to reach out to others as well that will not only benefit them, but benefit ourselves as well. So, Lord, we, we come to you, and in the midst of the struggles we face, we are grateful, not for those struggles, but for your presence and for the presence of your people. Thank you, Jesus, for caring and loving us in such a special way at such a special time. In your name, amen.
us feel led, sing along with us. God 
so excited that you guys joined us and don't forget whatever you do and wherever you go don't forget to tell somebody about Jesus